so. Good morning. Can you hear me back there? Can you hear me? All right. <clears throat> it's go time. It's my privilege to lead the discussion this morning. We continue our summer quarter of rotating teachers in the auditorium class, and it's my privilege to do it today. As you can see, our lesson's entitled, Take Heed Lest You Fall. And I'm looking forward to leading our discussion this morning, and hopefully we can glean some things that would be beneficial to all of us as I've always said, and many of you have held this capacity before, the one who learns the most is the teacher. So I'm looking forward to leading our discussion this morning. I'd invite you to turn with us to our text this morning, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll read that verse of our text this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There's so much in that one verse, and we'll get into that as the lesson unfolds this morning. But I've, at, at, at this time, I need to get my clicker. I'll make sure I turn it off for next session so the battery won't run down. But I want to focus on a popular false doctrine to begin our study this morning. Well, advance it one slide. Can you? There it is. All right. How many have you ever heard this before? Once saved, always saved. And this is a doctrine that a lot of folks in the religious world take comfort in, but it's a false doctrine. And I wish to expand on that a little bit further. The proof text or the proposed proof text of this false doctrine is found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. <clears throat> no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Certainly that's a very comforting section of scripture, and this is the proposed proof text that would support that once you're saved, you're always saved, there's nothing you can do to fall from grace. Do we agree with that? I'm afraid that's not correct. And we're going to come provide several uh, sections of scripture this morning that will prove that this is a false doctrine. And if you really dissect uh, this section of Scripture, there are several key phrases or key words, such as abide, which is a continuous action. It means to declare, to agree, to admit, to acknowledge, to praise. It means that we have a part in our portion of salvation. It means that we have an action that must continually uh, go on for us to be in a right relationship with the Father. Confesses again, declare, agree, admit, and so forth. Abide meaning stay, remain. Again, meaning an action verb that we have a part in our salvation. We have known and believed that love of God has for us. God is love and he who abides, meaning remain, stay, or wait, in love abides in God and God in him. But in this same book, in 1 John, we back up to chapter 1, which is a favorite section of patch, uh, section passage of, of Scripture. I'll invite you to turn back there with me, 1 John chapter 1. <clears throat> we focus in on verses 7 through 10. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, 
and his word is not in us. Again, this one section of scripture would refute once saved, always saved, but we have many, many more that we will present, Lord willing, as our lesson unfolds today. I'll invite you also to 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, and he who does the will of God abides forever. I would invite your attention to that phrase, does the will of God. Again, it lends itself toward the idea that we have a role in what we are supposed to do in order to be in a correct relationship with God the Father. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. Basically, the proof text that we've, that we've presented this morning to try to support this false doctrine of once saved, always saved is a lazy man's view that I can live like the devil's goat and be okay with God. Now, if that were true, but it's not. However, we've all seen a lot of folks live their lives just that way, do they not? And certainly, that is not pleasing to God. Matthew 7, verse 21, certainly would refute this once saved, always saved doctrine. And this is Jesus himself speaking. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Galatians 5, 4, which we'll get to in just a few moments. You become estranged from Christ who you have attempted to be justified by the law. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands... Beg your pardon. Let me get to that. I misquoted that. Galatians 5, 4. You have become estranged from Christ. You have attempt, you who attempt to be justified by the law, you have what? Fallen from grace. That is not where we want to be, fallen from grace. And again, we go back to the text that we started with this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 12 and 13. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able but with a temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Again here, this verse tells us that temptation is common to man. Everyone faces it. There's no one person that will not face temptation. Christ himself faced temptation many, many times. Many, many times, especially in Matthew chapter 4, which we'll get to. But again, even though temptation is common to man... God will provide a way of escape, but it's up to us to take it. We must take advantage of that avenue to remove ourselves from temptation. Again, if once saved, always saved is correct, then Simon the sorcerer had nothing to worry about in Acts chapter 8. Remember Simon the sorcerer? Who, who did actually become a member of the church. But then what did he want to do after that? He saw the power of the Holy Spirit that the apostles were laying, uh, doing these uh, miracles. What did he want to do? He wanted to buy that. And then did they not tell him? Can't do that. Pray that thy thought of thy wickedness may be forgiven. And he was after he asked for it. Certainly the parable of the sowers would also tell us that once saved, always saved is a false doctrine. We know the parable of the sowers. Some of the seed fell in good ground, some by the wayside, some in the thorny places. We know that we must have fertile hearts. 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Again, I would focus your attention on the first word of the second sentence in this section of Scripture. Continue in them, which again is an action verb requiring action on our part. Romans 6, verses. Verse 12, therefore do not let sin, what? Reign. Take control of. Be the boss of. 
Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. And again, this is very good advice from the Apostle Paul to the young evangelist Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, where he tells Timothy and all those who would hear, especially us today, flee youthful lusts, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, with those who call on the Lord out of a what? Pure heart. Again, here's the answer to our question this morning, if this is a, a false doctrine. Obviously it is. And again, Paul gives us the answer as to how we handle it. Flee youthful lusts. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace out of a pure heart. No question about it. That's what we should do. Let me see if this thing works this time. Ah, here we go. All right. I submit to you that the old term backsliding is a gradual process. It doesn't happen overnight. It kind of eases up on us and we get more and more comfortable with not doing some of the things we should, doing some of the things we shouldn't. Certainly backsliding is a gradual process. And the Bible defines it as such. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 of Philippians, again, a book of joy, four short, cha four, four short chapters, say that three times fast, but it's packed with encouragement and edification as Paul writes this from a prison cell. Philippians chapter 3, we'll focus in on verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but again, here's the answer that Paul's giving us. But I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but I do one thing, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Again, here's the answer. I press toward, which means that we have a part to do. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. What a marvelous section of Scripture, and one that we can certainly take comfort in. The pathway of life is littered with those who have fallen by the wayside. And again, we preach in order to persuade men to, so that they may understand that we have a part in trying to get to heaven. Now again, we're saved by grace, there's no question about that, but we have an active role in our salvation. Matthew chapter 7, the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus himself tells us in verses 13 and 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in therein. Because narrow is the gate, or straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Straight and difficult is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Jesus told us off the bat, there are going to be a few that find it. But the road to destruction is wide and broad. And I'm sorry to say that a lot of folks are on that pathway. Galatians 5.4, again, we go back to that text. You have become estranged from Christ. You have attempted to be justified by the law. Again, here Paul is speaking to those who are trying to go back to the law of Moses. But again, he's saying there's no need for that anymore. There's no need to be justified by the law of Moses. We have something better. Again, I submit to you that the book of Hebrews basically is written for the purpose of saying that we have something better. There are at least 13 betters in the book of Hebrew that tells us there is a better covenant under which today we live. And aren't we thankful for that? Aren't we thankful for that? If not, I submit to you that we should be. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 is also an excellent section of Scripture that lends itself toward our discussion this morning. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed 
to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. You wonder why we encourage folks to try to be at every worship service, every area-wide singing, every Brothers Keepers group event, every activity of the church, either here in this building or as a collaborative effort from other locations, from other congregations that we try to get together so that we can edify one another, so that we can empower one another, so that we can build up one another. What's the purpose of that? So that we won't drift away, so that we never get far from our anchor, the anchor of the soul. Therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedient received a just reward, how shall we escape? How shall we escape if we what? Neglect so great a salvation. <clears throat> if we can just pause and imagine how wonderful heaven will be, and how horrible hell is. We would do anything in our power to escape hell and gain heaven. And this is our goal, and this is what we're attempting to do as we live this life. We certainly don't want to let our love grow cold, as Matthew 24, 12 through 13 tells us. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Again, Jesus is telling us we have a part in our salvation. We have a part in our salvation. And if all of this doesn't register, perhaps Jesus' words to the seven churches of Asia in the beginning of the last book of the New Testament written by John Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Revelation 2, beginning in verse 4, <clears throat> as he talks to the seven churches of Asia. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and then he tells them what to do. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless what? You repent. He continually encourages those seven churches of Asia. You're doing good, but here's where you're not, and this is what you need to do to fix it. Can we take benefit from those words today? I submit to you we can, and yea, we should. So backsliding is a gradual process. Let's look at some examples of some apostasy in the Bible. Can you think of certain Bible people that are examples of apostasy off the top of your head. This is where you have a speaking part. How about, there are several, but we'll just look at a few. How about Lot? You remember what happened to Lot? <clears throat> remember what happened to Lot's wife? How many of you watched uh, Brother Phil Sanders this morning on Channel 57? He's great, isn't he? You remember him talking about Lot's wife? You remember what his topic was? was about the Old Testament versus the New, and we live under a better covenant, excellently presented. Very easy and simple to understand. <clears throat> but we know what happened a lot in uh, Genesis 13, where Lot's still with Abram, Abraham. They get into a squabble, and what does Abraham tell him? We be what? Brethren. Let's not fight. Let's get along. Because we're brethren. We need to act like it. We need to act like brethren toward each other. My herdsman toward your herdsman. We need to be like brethren. <clears throat> and then he gave him his choice. <clears throat> you see all this land in front of you. Which side do you want? Abraham let him have his choice. And which choice did he take? He, he took the well-watered plains toward where? Sodom. So again, if this is not proof that backsliding is a gradual process, Lot began that process when he pitched his tents toward Sodom because it was pleasing to the eye. He liked it. And he thought all of his people and his herdsmen and his family would like it too. But how did it end up? Not so good. Not good at all. 
I would submit to you also that this is one of the ones that you may have thought right off the bat. What's a good example of apostasy in the Bible? Obviously, the prodigal son. Here's the prodigal son. All is going well until the younger son says, you know what? I'm ready to live. Give me my inheritance, Father, and I'll go and I'll live it up. And he did exactly that. And he had a lot of friends until what happened? He lost his money. And what happened to all of his friends? They're gone. So then he's in the pig pen, which is not where a young Hebrew boy needs to be in the first place. And he's feeding the swine. And he's so hungry he wants to eat what he's feeding the hogs. Now that's hungry, isn't it? But who else does he have to blame but himself for being in that situation? But the one good thing about this story is what? The Bible tells us he came to himself. He's like, I did this, but I know what I need to do to fix it. And he went back to his father. And what was his father doing all that time while he was gone? Do I see my son? Do I see him coming back to me over the horizon? He saw him. And what did the father do? He ran to meet him. Now when we get off the beaten path, when we stray from what we know was right, and when we come to ourselves and we understand, boy, I need to make some changes. I need to do what's right. I need to repent. I need to ask forgiveness. And I need to straighten up and fly right and go through that straight and narrow way. And what does our Father do to us? He runs to meet us. He wants to embrace us. He says, I want you to do what's right. I want you to live with me eternally. I want you to enter into the joys that I've prepared for you. How about another example of apostasy? Peter, not Peter. Peter, I would submit to you, would be the most or the staunchest defender of Christ Jesus as the apostles that were living with him. Peter, the one that says, no, Lord, you're not going back to that place where these people are going to persecute you. I'm going to stand in your way. Jesus told him, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter didn't understand. He wanted to protect Jesus. He wanted to protect him. So much that on the night of his arrest, what did he almost do to one of the priest's servants? He almost cut his head off with a sword. He hit his ear. I don't think that's where he was aiming. Peter, the staunchest defender of Christ, protect him to the death, shield Christ from harm. Yet, on the night of Christ's arrest and mock trial by the chief priests and elders and the Pharisees, Peter denied him three times. I don't know the man. Well, your speech deceives you. Your speech gives you away. I don't know the man and cursed and said, I don't know the man. Leave me alone. Immediately thereafter, Christ looked at him. They locked eyes. And he wept bitterly. Not a few hours before, Peter said, I'll defend you to the death. I won't let anybody stand in your way and try to hurt you. Yet Peter himself, out of his own mouth, said, I don't know the man. Now that's an example of apostasy, is it not? Yet, did Peter fix it? Did he make amends? We know Peter's future. He wrote at least two two books of the Bible that bear his name. He was also an elder of the Lord's church. So Peter is an example of apostasy, but he's also an example of what to do to make things right. I would submit to you also that Demas, what do we know about Demas? Was he a faithful member of the church at one time? Yes, he was. In Philemon, the only chapter, verse 24, it says, and as Paul is writing this letter to Philemon on behalf of the slave Onesimus, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborer. So here's Demas, a fellow laborer to Paul. In Colossians 4.14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. 
Demas, again, is serving with Luke, one of the writers of the New Testament. Then shortly thereafter, a downfall. In 2 Timothy verse, or chapter 4, verse 10, For Demas has forsaken me. Why? Having loved this present world. Oh, there's so many things in front of us that we want to have fun, we want to partake of. Sin is pleasurable, there's no question about it. But again, Demas was short-sighted enough to have loved this present world and forsaken Paul and the church. And that's easy for us to do today. And again, I go back to, the, to my encouraging words just a little bit ago. Why do we encourage folks to worship with the saints, to go to area-wide singings, to be part of Brothers Keepers groups? This is why. So that we can understand and focus and keep our focus on what's important, which is the church and not the world. These are just but a few examples, and I'm sure that you can think of some others. But for time's sake, we move on. That clock is going quickly. What does the Bible say about our ability to fall away? <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, back up one chapter in that great, great book. Beware. Now, from the very first word of that verse, what does that word beware mean? Better stay on guard. Danger. Warning. Beware. Brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief. Now, we can either believe or not. It's up to us. An unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, we can identify several sections of Scripture in God's Word that would refute that false doctrine that we started our lesson with, once saved, always saved. Here's another one. That verse alone would refute the false doctrine of one once saved, always saved, lest you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This is one of my favorites in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Here, Paul, even Paul says, you know what? I need to watch it. I, I, I would dare say that Paul, one of the, and I hate to rank the apostles as importance but you know what I'm saying I mean who wrote most almost half the New Testament Paul he was a pro prolific writer he was very faithful and if you think about the irony of when Jesus selected him to be one of his apostles before that time he was one of if not the greatest persecutor of the church he hated the church he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He did everything he could do to stamp it out. And Paul was no lightweight as far as his knowledge of the law. He knew the law. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew it backwards and forwards. And this, this church thing is bad news. I'm going to do everything I can do to stamp it out and get rid of all those people who have anything to do with it. So Paul, Saul, as he was known at that point, did everything he could do to be a persecutor of the church. Yet on the Damascus Road, he hears Jesus. He didn't see anything. He heard him. And I submit to you that Saul was going this way. Then after he became a member of the church, he did a 180 and went this way. From being the greatest persecutor of the church to being the greatest defender, promoter of the church. Is that not ironic? Have you ever thought about that? Yes, sir. That's right. 
Exactly right. I mean, Paul did not rest on his laurels. And here in uh, this section of Scripture, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body, soul and body, and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself may become disqualified. <coughs> not Paul, surely not Paul. Not Peter, surely not Peter. Yes, even Peter. Yes, even Paul. Should that not be a chilling reminder to us to be diligent? to protect our soul, to do what's right, to be part of the congregation and do as much as we can to edify not only ourselves but others. And again, probably the most famous section of Scripture that a lot of folks can go to to prove that you can fall from grace. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Here, Peter is teaching toward those, those that would present false doctrine. For it, after having escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which again would apply to us once we become members of the church, we escape the pollutions of the world. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again entangle themselves in them and overcome the latter and is worse for them than the beginning. It's better that they would not even have known. Whew. Boy, that's tough. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, and having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow, after having been washed, returned to her wallowing in the mire. You wonder why the... Uh, of course, we all have this responsibility, but those of us that are elders of this congregation, we go and we visit with folks on occasion. Well, we hadn't seen you in a while. We'd love to have you to come back. What can we do to help you? Is there anything that you're having a problem with? How can we help encourage you to make things right? All that stems from, certainly, this section of Scripture. We want to encourage folks to be part of the greatest institution that man has ever known, and to stay faithful to it. Stay faithful to it. What else does the Bible say about if we can fall? Does it have anything else to say? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Staying in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. All right, how did that happen? Romans 6 tells us that we bury the old man of sin into the watery grave of what? Baptism. Raised to walk in what? Newness of life. So, if that's one of the happiest days of your life, when you become a member of the church, you've been buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. How do we forget that? How can we forget that? We lose our focus. Therefore, brethren, be even what? More diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. We have an active part in our salvation. Make your calling and election sure. Do these things, you'll never stumble. That should be very comforting to us. Again in 2 Peter chapter 3. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand... Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. Being led away with the error of the wicked. Boy, how do we prevent that? Grow. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How are we going to do that? You remember these old computers, and all you computer guys would know this, and this shows you my age as far as computers are concerned. When you're copying a file from one, you know, you, you get that computer screen that's got that manila folder here and a manila folder there, and you want to take files from this, and it kind of goes like that. You remember that? Wouldn't that be nice if we could get the knowledge of Christ and somebody just put it in their head? It's not that easy, is it? We've got to apply ourselves. Thus is why we're sitting here this morning listening to some guy appear boring, 
and droning on. But I'm hopeful that we're gaining something from this. <clears throat> Hebrews 6, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Boy, if nothing else that we've studied this morning, if that doesn't hit you right between the eyes, I don't know what will. You know the horrible scene of Christ and what he had to endure during the process of his trial and the scourging and nailing to a cross. That's bad enough to go through once. But we certainly don't want to do that again and again and again. All right, I need to hustle because time is getting past. What are some evidences of backsliding? Well, we start neglecting God's word. We miss the bread of life, the loss of appetite. Again, when Jesus was being tempted, when he went up into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and Satan joined him out there. And on that last day, you go without food for 40 days, you're going to be pretty hungry. And the first thing Satan tempts him with is what? Food. Turn these stones to bread. And again, Jesus' first response and his first three words of his sentence were what? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We neglect God's word. We lose our appetite. That's another evidence of backsliding. Spiritual immaturity. Hebrews 5.12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, milk and not solid food so we're reverting if we're not growing we're dying is that not right we're not growing we're not reading our bibles we're not aiming toward being teachers now that's one of the benefits of having these rotating teachers in the auditorium class we have some of these guys that typically don't teach in a auditorium type setting but once you do and you know that it's coming you're going to study. I guarantee you, you're going to study. And that's a good thing. Isn't that right, Robert? That's a good thing. Weakening prayer life. How often are we supposed to pray? Without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 tells us we're to pray without ceasing. But in this section of Scripture, Matthew 5, Jesus tells us how. And when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I tell you, they have their reward, which is being seen by men. But you, when you pray, go into your room when you've shut the door. Pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they that think they will be heard for their many words. Again, hear. We have a weakening prayer life. We're on the way to backsliding. We have a growing fondness for worldly pleasures. Eh, I want to go do something else. I don't need to. Sure is a pretty day outside. I want to go do something else instead of go to worship service. It's not going to hurt this one time. Before you know it, eh, I'm missing two Sundays a month. Before you know it, I'm gone. Growing fondness for worldly pleasures. Think of Demas. We just talked about him. Making excuses for Christian duty and worship. You know the parable of the Great Supper. The master sends his servants out to invite those to the Great Supper, and they all have one excuse after another. Oh, I've married a wife. Oh, I've uh, bought some land. I need to test some oxen. One excuse after another. Discontent and fault-finding. If we spend as much time studying, perhaps, as we do in being discontented and finding fault with others, we wouldn't have to be discontented in finding fault with others. Decreasing anxiety for the salvation of others. Oh, how can you say that to somebody? You're so mean. Would we not much rather offend somebody here while they have the opportunity to do something about it than to not try to help them make their decision to be in a restored condition? before it's everlasting too late. 
Okay, I had a lot of others, but it looks like I spent too much time on some of the other things. I, again, appreciate your interest and attention in our class this morning.